I was raised in the church, and because of that, I've gone through a lot of communion services. And I remember back in the day when my mom was in charge, uh, you know, she would take her turn fixing communion, which meant that after the service was over, I got to go and drink up the little cups of juice that were left over and scarf up a few handfuls of the, of the little bread. And I've probably heard thousands of communion meditations, thoughts before we share the Lord's Supper together. Um, and uh, I could parrot a lot of the catchphrases that I heard. Um, in the congregations that we were raised in, one person would read a scripture, make a few comments, and this would be followed by two prayers, one for the loaf and one for the cup. And I remember uh, one of the services that we went to, uh, the elder who was kind of in charge and doing that, and he was whipping into the cliches and stuff, and his mind froze. I don't know if you've ever had that when you're trying to talk. And his mind just froze. And he asked God to bless the bread and, and the cup, which is the fruit of the cup, the cup of the blood, the fruit of the juice, the fruit of the, fruit of the, and I was scared he was going to say fruit of the loom. He didn't. He stopped short of that. He just said juice. And, and you know, have you ever gotten the giggles at the wrong time? You know, and you start to go and you can't stop. And that's kind of the way that service was. It was really bad because I was on staff at that church. Um, today we're in de- in devoting this entire service to the Lord's Supper because it's central to the message that Bethel preaches And also, I can't think of a better way for us to start this season together. And we're going to do it a little different than normal, as Pastor Jim mentioned, because your interim is a little different than normal. Um, And I, quite frankly, think it's good to change up some things from time to time, uh, because we get caught in routines so easily, and we just kind of click through it. So we want this to be more than a religious ritual today, okay? This is how we do the communion here. Uh, because we're taking a closer look at the Lord's Supper. There's an outline of this uh, message today and of the service today, and I hope that you'll use that to fill in a few of the blanks. Um, And you also will know how close we are to the end of the service. That's another reason why outlines are helpful. Now, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to hold on to two texts, two passages. One is in Luke 22, and the second one is in 1 Corinthians 11. That's mentioned on the top of your outlines. And we'll be kind of flipping back and forth between those. We're going to be looking at communion from five different angles today. And we're going to start by looking back because communion certainly is a time of remembrance. First of all, we need to look back to the Passover. How many of you have ever participated in an Easter Seder? It's kind of a Christianized version of a Passover. Some of you have done that before. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, this celebration of the old Jewish Passover, but now taking on new meaning, and we have been in some seders that can go as, between three and four hours long, so it's a, it's a pretty big deal. It includes scripture reading, songs, testimonies, and of course the traditional Passover meal. Many of you are aware that every item on the Passover menu is symbolic. It means something. Uh, and specifically related to the Israelites' release from Egyptian bondage. The main course is lamb. Uh, Recalled how every family was to slay a lamb and mark the doorpost with its blood so that the death angel would pass over. And so that's where we get Passover, the the idea of the Passover. There's also unleavened, unleavened bread, which means that there's no yeast in it. It symbolized bread eaten quickly. They couldn't take time for it to rise because they had to get it out of town as soon as possible. A bowl of salt water represents the tears they had shed during the years of slavery, as well as the waters of the Red Sea. A collection of bitter herbs, that's horseradish, chicory, endive, lettuce, and whorehound, to remind them of the bitterness of all those years of slavery. One year... The guy that was leading our Seder, he got extra hot horseradish, and it brought the whole place to tears and coughs, as I recall. But that was the idea of the bitter herbs. There's a paste called karasheth. It's made up of apples, dates, pomegranates, and nuts, uh, a reminder of the clay that was used uh, as mortar to put the bricks together in Egypt. It almost sounds like the ingredients of a Christmas fruitcake, doesn't it? I'm gonna, not going to ask for a show of hands on how many of you like it, and how many of you don't like it, but some of the ingredients do bring that to mind. And then sticks of cinnamon reminded them of the straw with which the bricks were made. And finally, 
four cups of wine. Actually, there are four toasts during a Seder, and you were toasting different aspects of God's goodness, especially in releasing them from slavery. So that was the idea of the four cups of wine. Not only was this meal symbolic for the Jews, it was also nostalgic. From their reading of scriptures and conversations within the community, they would kind of reenact these historic events, much like we do with the nativity scene, right? We reenact those events every year. The ten plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, the drowning of Pharaoh's army, the provision of water and manna in the wilderness. The Passover was traditional and nostalgic for faithful Jews. An annual celebration when family met around a festive table to sing, eat, pray, laugh, and weep, especially if the horseradish was extra hot. Something like a traditional Thanksgiving service that we have where the menu is somewhat predictable. Maybe some of you do different things, but you know, you know the drill. And part of the attraction of Thanksgiving is that we're most likely going to have the turkey and dressing and the candied yams, the cranberry sauce, the pumpkin pie with mounds of Cool Whip. And um, that just strikes a friendly chord. We look forward to that with football in the background. Yours probably included some of those things, a traditional Thanksgiving meal. This is a traditional Passover meal. And it was out of this Passover feast that the Lord's Supper was instituted by Jesus on the night before his crucifixion. So turn with me to our first passage, which is in Luke 22. Very familiar to many of you if you've been going to communion services for a while. Luke 22, and we're going to pick it up at verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again, drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So the Lord's Supper, we certainly look back to the Passover, but we know we also look back to the cross. This new meal would become symbolic and nostalgic to, for followers of Jesus Christ. So this is the meal after the meal. Passover, the big deal, the big menu. Jesus takes two elements out of this. It's kind of an after-dinner thing. Uh, and they symbolized, obviously, a new covenant between God and his people. The bread now represents Jesus' own physical body, which would be offered up on the cross as a sacrifice for sin. The wine or the fruit juice represented his blood, which dripped from that precious head and hands and feet and side. I don't think the disciples got the point when it was happening. I think they were kind of in, what's all this all about type of a thing. But after the crucifixion and resurrection, then it scored. Oh, that's what he was saying. And they obeyed Jesus' command to share this symbolic, nostalgic meal regularly in remembrance of him. And it replaced the old Passover feast because the final, ultimate sacrifice for sin had been offered. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For the disciples, the cross was both a terrible and a wonderful memory. As we share the Lord's Supper together, there are two things we need to remember. First of all, we need to remember the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, payment for our sins. But beyond this, to remember the time when it scored with us. Oh, he did that for me. He did that for me. And we're going to spend a little time right now to re remember all of this as our worship band leads us in a song called Living Hope. And I want you to think to a time when it really scored with you that Jesus died on the cross for you.
it's important that we engage ourselves in some spiritual nostalgia, looking back, remembering Christ, but it's also a time to look within. It's a time of reflection. And of course, that reflection means that we examine the heart. The Apostle Paul emphasized this in our second passage, which is 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, we're going to pick it up at verse 23. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you drink this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. There's often confusion about what it means to eat or drink in an unworthy manner. Some believe it means that if you've lost your temper or lusted or pilfered from the company, you'd better not partake of the Lord's Supper. You better just pass the elements on by. The truth is, if you've done any of those things, you have a greater need for this time. The Lord's Supper is an opportunity for a gut check on how we're doing with our spiritual life, how we're doing with our moral life, thought, word, deed. We partake in an unworthy manner when we partake thoughtlessly, when we're unwilling to face up to our sins, when we're unwilling to expose our hearts to the blood of Christ, which cleanses us from daily sin. Now, when we give our lives to Christ, we are totally and completely bathed. We're made righteous in God's eyes. Titus 3, 5 through 7. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we're made righteous, we're made clean as soon as we come into that saving relationship with Christ. But the reality is that our fellowship with Christ can become soiled. It can become soiled by the world, around us that we live in. It can also be soiled by our own fleshly life. And it affects our spiritual growth. It affects our fellowship with him. It affects our service for him. So we need to come before him regularly, examine ourselves, confess, and turn from all known sin. Remember that the Christian life, like your shirts, come with washing instructions. And most of you probably know what the tag says. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's talking about that daily soiling from the world and from our own fleshly life. Now, there's several ways to approach a time of self-examination, but I'm going to lead us in one today, which is using the Ten Commandments as some checkpoints for the heart to see how we're doing. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just bow or however you reflect best, maybe close your eyes. And I'm going to briefly walk through these 10 commandments and give you an opportunity to kind of test it, test and probe a little bit. How am I doing in this area? How am I doing in this area? How am I doing in this area? So the first of the 10 commandments is no other gods. Is God the top priority in my life? Or has the job, a relationship, a hobby, an interest, a possession superseded him? No graven image. Am I worshiping the real God or am I worshiping a religion, a symbol, or a ceremony? Don't take God's name in vain. How's your language? Have you used the titles God or Jesus in a frivolous or profane manner? Remember the Sabbath. 
Is your life balanced physically, emotionally, and spiritually? Are you really setting aside that time to give holy to the Lord? Attention, workaholics who are having a hard time even blocking out the stuff that you have to face this afternoon or tomorrow when you really need to have that focus on the Lord. Honor your father and mother. If they're still living, are you in contact with them? Are you showing them respect? Are you serving them? If they're not living, how do you remember them? How do you speak about them? Fondly? Angrily? Have you forgiven them? Are you still blaming them? Don't kill. Maybe you feel good about this one except for that deer on the road. But what about that outburst of anger? the seething bitterness, the unforgiveness. Don't commit adultery. Are you feeding lust? Are you developing an inappropriate relationship before or beyond your marriage? Don't steal. Could be from Walmart and the IRS, an inflated bill for services rendered or wasting company time. Don't lie. That that includes knowingly leaving false impressions, covering your tracks. Don't covet. Are you envious? Are you jealous? Are you discontent with where you are and what you have? There are other kinds of examination questions, but it's important that we get honest before God in order to get cleansed. By the way, Paul says, um, let a man examine himself, not the other guy, not your spouse, not your relatives, not your co-workers, not your fellow church members. Let a man examine himself. Paul's admonition on self-examination has a hook in it. God holds us accountable for our behavior. And so we need to heed this warning, picking up again from 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 29. Everyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. Now, that's pretty strong stuff. If we don't regularly examine ourselves, confess, repent, and get cleansed, Paul says there are consequences. There are consequences for our lives. And he lists some of them. Physical weakness, sickness, and death may all result, be the result of prolonged estrangement from the Lord. Now, I don't believe that every case of weakness, sickness, and death is caused by partaking in an unworthy manner, but there may be a connection more times than we realize between our living transparently before the Lord. Taking the Lord's Supper unworthily means that we're not being that open with Him. So we can kind of compare communion services to a regular physical or dental checkup. Isn't that a sweet thing? Now you think about that and say, no, the the Lord's Supper is just supposed to be a sweet time, a loving time, a happy time, when in reality it's like going in for an x-ray or an MRI or an ultrasound where the Holy Spirit is free to kind of poke and probe and every so often we think, ooh, that hurt. That wasn't very pleasant. But that's what it means to examine yourself. To examine yourself. Now, on a more positive side, the honest observance of the Lord's Supper can represent a fresh start. That's the great thing about it, isn't it? We open ourselves up to him. We allow that poking and probing. We're even willing to go through some uncomfortable feelings about things that are revealed, and we bring them before the Lord, and it's that fresh start again. It's that mid-course correction that keeps us walking with the Lord. I want you to feel free to sing along or just to meditate as our worship band leads us in singing a song that's so appropriate 
give us clean hands. We're taking a closer look at the Lord's Supper. We look back because it's a time of remembrance. We look within because it's a time of reflection. And now we see that we're also looking around because it's a time of fellowship. Fellowship with each other. One of the things that makes a great meal even better is the people you share it with, right? Those who are around the table with you. During our mission several years ago to Eastern Europe, I had uh, an opportunity to experience a wide variety of meals that left distinct impressions. In Vienna, I enjoyed authentic Austrian uh, goulash in an old world restaurant. In Moscow, we feasted on an ethnic delicacy, Big Mac fries, and a shake at McDonald's. And after eating a lot of strange food, believe me, it was like ambrosia. It also cost about a buck and a half. It was good stuff. In Kharkov, Ukraine, our team uh, ate with a dear brother, Leonid, and his wife, six children, other family, and friends. Very humble home. But they fixed a banquet of soup, vegetable salad, toast with melted cheese, cucumber, and an egg on top. Main course was a stew fixed in individual pots with grape juice from their vines, cake with berry sauce, and Russian tea. After dinner, we engaged in lively conversation and laughter with halting English and halting Russian. And that was followed by a musical concert from this dear family singing and playing the piano and accordion and violin. The menu was unique, but the meal was rich. It was tasty. We enjoyed a banquet with these believers. History tells us that early Christians celebrated the Lord's Supper in an elaborate way, usually on Sunday nights, because the Sabbath, Saturday, was the day off, remember? And then Sunday was a work day, the first day of the week. And so they met on Sunday nights. Began with a fellowship meal, something like we'd call a potluck back east, They call it a dish to pass. I'd never heard that term before, a dish to pass. But everybody contributes. Everybody contributes. And this would be followed by a sermon. So you'd have your potluck and you'd have your sermon. Like the one that Paul preached. Remember, he preached till midnight. Eutychus fell out the second story window. And that's why it's safer for church auditoriums to be on the ground level. And after that came a time of confession, either private or public if it was appropriate. And then the elements of the Lord's Supper were shared among them. The thing I want you to see here is the rich fellowship among Christians. Jesus demonstrated the spirit of this. If we go back to our our first passage in Luke chapter 22, verses 14 and 15, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, these men had walked and talked and lived and worked and prayed and wept and laughed together for three years. There's just something about eating together that bonds us together in a special way. When we share these elements, I hope that you will have an opportunity to look around and praise God for the people that you are sharing the Lord's Supper with. Um, You may see brothers and sisters with whom you've been doing this together with them for five years, 10 years, 15 years, or more. You also may either look around the room or in your mind, see brothers and sisters from whom you have become estranged for one reason or another. You may look around and notice some people are missing because of death or maybe departure from Bethel Church. And if there's any of those issues that come to mind, especially that personal estrangement, this would be a good time for you to resolve to do something about that. And one of the things that I would hope to help you to do is to mediate some reconciliation, if that's needed, with some of you. We're family. And um, that's warts and all, isn't it? Not perfect people. And so we know that just like we have faults, those people do as well. And that means that there's going to have to be some forgiveness. There's going to have to be accepting some responsibility and asking forgiveness where that is appropriate. Our unity, our oneness, our relationship with Christ is symbolized in the elements as well. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul wrote, 
is not the cup of blessing which we bless, a sharing in the blood of Christ. It's not the bread which we break, a sharing in the body of Christ. Since there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. This is symbolizing our unity in Christ. So it's fellowship with each other, but it's also fellowship with the Lord. It's a time to worship Him, to adore Him for who He is, for what He means to us. And it's not just Jesus suffering on the cross, but it's Jesus teaching and comforting and praying for and loving us. It's Christ resurrected and ascended and now at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. That's what we're thinking about when we're talking about fellowship with the Lord. Our fellowship with Him is by faith, since we can't physically see Him, but He is here, especially in a unique way when we share these elements together. And I hope you've connected with Him today. I hope that you have sensed His presence today in this service. That's the most important thing. The Lord's Supper is a time to look back and remember. It's a time to look within and reflect. It's a time to look around in fellowship, and it's also a time to look out because this is a time of testimony. We're giving a testimony concerning His sacrifice. When we share the Lord's Supper properly, we're preaching a mini-sermon. We're preaching a mini-sermon 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, that's the same word as preach, you preach the Lord's death until he comes. The elements tell a story. The elements are the gospel in a nutshell. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 is a passage I like to call the gospel in a nutshell. I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. It's possible that there are some here who have never given your hearts to Christ. You've never invited him to come into your life. And I want to ensure you that you are welcome at this Lord's Supper. I appreciate the way Pastor Jim said it when I was here a month ago. This is an open table, okay? It's an open table from that standpoint. Now, the Lord's Supper is meaningful believers, but we hope that you get the point We want you to understand about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that he died on the cross for you and that he died for you as much as he died for anybody here. We're not perfect people. We're forgiven people because we've accepted the remedy for sin. So the elements preach that sermon. They tell the story of Christ's sacrifice, but they also speak volumes about our allegiance to Christ as believers. This isn't my supper. This isn't Bethel's supper. So in a sense, we can't invite you to participate, nor can we keep you from doing so. This is the Lord's Supper. And it's prepared for those who, by their own conscience and testimony, are born-again believers. By partaking of these elements, you're declaring to those around that you are committed to Him. You are allied with Him. Whether you're sitting in a church service or in a sales office, riding a motorcycle, or riding a tractor, you are openly aligned with him. You're identified as a Christ follower. And if you're not willing to identify yourself as a Christ follower out there, be very careful about hypocrisy in here. We're connected with him. This morning we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper in a different way than you may be used to. Actually, some of this was done before I got here. We have a different arrangement for communion, and actually you're going to see the bread in the middle of the tray. So you've got cups on the side, and then you've got the bread in the middle. And this is the way we're going to ask you to do it. As the trays are passed, you take a piece of bread, and then you just kind of put it on your knee, and you take a cup and you hold it. And as song is being sung, when you're ready, you partake of the elements. In other words, we're not going to partake all together, the bread and the cup. As you're meditating, as you're spending this time with the Lord, maybe tying into the song that's being sung, when you're ready, you partake of the loaf and you partake of the cup. And as you do so, remember that we need to look back. It's a time of remembrance. We're looking within because it's a time of reflection. We're looking around because it's a time of fellowship. And we're going to look out because this 
is a time of testimony. So let's bow together in prayer and then come to the altar as the song says. Lord Jesus, I pray that this truly will be a communion with you and with one another as we share the bread and the cup, recognizing their greater meaning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've looked back. We've looked within. We've looked around and we've looked out. And we want to see one more direction, one more angle of the Lord's Supper, and that is looking ahead as a time of anticipation. First of all, anticipation to a bountiful feast. I hope this has been a meaningful service, but there's an even more wonderful Lord's Supper that is ahead of us. Jesus said this in Matthew 26, 29, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, what will that be like? A couple of things come to my mind. Uh, he sets up his uh, throne in Jerusalem to reign for a thousand years on the earth, and the entire world can connect via internet be a satellite, and share in that Lord's Supper together from all over the place. But he also may be referring to the great marriage supper of the Lamb that's written about in Revelation, so I'm going to throw one more scripture in there because I think you can handle it. Revelation 19. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 6. I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, write, blessed are those who were invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Well, whatever Jesus is referring to there, it's going to be a bountiful feast, homecoming meal, well worth the wait, because it's going to usher us into a glorious future. The Lord's Supper reminds us of the wonderful promise of eternal life to all those who have trusted Christ as Savior. Revelation 5, 9 they sang a new song with these words, you are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it, for you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people from God, for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Heaven is going to be a wonderful place, but we're never going to forget how we got there and why we got there and who got us there. That's what we're going to celebrate for eternity. We made a few thing changes to the service today. Brace yourself, folks. There's more coming. You get a guy from the left coast, that's what you get. Sorry about that. Pastor Jim mentioned earlier about the connection card in your bulletin and it provides the opportunity for you to provide comments and questions and prayer requests and praise reports and other kinds of communication so that this service changes from a monologue, the stuff coming at you, to a dialogue where we're able to respond back and forth. And it's going to be very helpful for me in getting a pulse of Bethel Church. And also as pastors and leaders, we can pray for you in very specific ways. And so we hope that you'll take advantage of the connection card from week to week. And, and you can place that in the offering when it comes by in just a few moments. Uh, we also encourage our guests, if you're new, fairly new to, uh, to Bethel, and we don't have your contact information, we would really appreciate it if you could share that with us. We can put you on the shout-out list so I can communicate with you midweek that way and other things that are happening in this, uh, in this fellowship. So as the offering plates are passed, drop your cards in along with your tithes and offerings. And we come to a, an opportunity like this and we say it's an act of worship. It's an act of worship. It's not the commercial part of the service where we kind of keep things going. This is an act of worship, and we're investing in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and we're expressing our commitment to him in this very tangible way. Let's bow together. Lord Jesus, I do pray that this has been a real experience of worship today, and that we have connected with you. And Lord, now as we bring these tithes and offerings before you, we're investing in the thing that's closest to your heart, and that's to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And I pray your richest blessing on those who give and certainly wisdom for those who uh, decide how this money will best be invested for the kingdom of Jesus Christ through Bethel Church. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name.